Floyd Patterson, Della Reese, Robert Klein, and uh, former uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Tom Clark will be here tomorrow night. But we have another Clark for you at the moment. I'm always at a loss to describe the man who's about to come out here next, uh, because he's so many things. He's an astronomer, an underwater expert, a novelist, a journalist, uh, a writer of science fiction and uh, science fact, you could say, uh, the creator of 2001. Ideas just seem to fly out of him. He, he once dreamed up um, the, the, the thought that possibly space satellites would be, uh, I mean, you know what I mean, communication satellites would be possible. Uh, people said, how silly. Will you welcome, please, a 21st century Renaissance man, Arthur Clark. Arthur C. Clark. I suppose there is a way when one thing will be the, the recurrent theme in a man's life, even though he's done a million other things. Has 2001 become that for you now, the, the yes, one thing you... Yes, I'm getting a little bored with it. A little tired of having people ask you, what did the ending mean and all that? Oh, I had to write a book to explain that, so I just refer them to that, and it saves a lot of bother. I remember, was it once a... Could it have been on an uh, interview with uh, some reason, Walter Cronkite, where you were asked that question once and you said, I, I wouldn't have time to answer that and probably never will, which I thought was an interesting answer. You weren't... You weren't looking for that an was some, that yeah, I got rather bored. I got so fed up with people asking the question I, yeah. that um, I put them off by that sort of rather flip remark. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did write a book called The Lost Worlds of 2001. Uh, you brought the subject up anyway. That's right. Now it's up. A whole, I wrote a whole book uh, giving not only the explanation of the ending, but all the alternative endings we might have used and didn't. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's nice. Um, Hey, wasn't there a new planet discovered recently, or possibly a new planet, a Dr. Brady or Mr. Brady, an astronomer? At, uh, a, a mathematician uh, at Livermore, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's been a, an astronomical scandal for quite a long time. You see, we knew that the orbits of the outer planets didn't conform strictly to the laws of gravity. There were perturbations. And uh, they tried to deduce the existence of another planet which could have caused this. And that mm -hmm. led to the discovery of Pluto in 1930. But when they found Pluto, it wasn't big enough to produce these perturbations. There so they're still looking, else. they're still looking. But yeah. they haven't actually seen anything, so it's only a theoretical concept. There probably is something out there, but we haven't detected it, haven't seen it yet. And uh, didn't it partly have to do with the fact that, do you say Halley's or Halley's Comet? I hear Halley's both. Comet. That it, it shows up around the sun four days earlier always than it's supposed to, and that might... The yes. only explanation for that would be the existence of some other planet. Why that can't is... they just look in the telescope and see if it's there? Well, that's, uh, the trouble is, you see, that um, there are so many hundreds of millions of star images. Mm -hmm. Now, Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered Pluto, he examined, I think, about 50 million separate star images. You had to, look, you had to have two photographs, take at two different times, and you have to look from one to the other to see if a star has moved, you see. Uh -huh. And he had to look at about 50 million pairs, and he still has hundreds, uh, I think, about uh, 20 or 30 million pairs of star images. He hasn't gotten around to examining even now. That's 40... 40 years later. I think I saw him on the street the other day. He goes like this all the time. <laughs> what a, what a job. Fantastic that, job. He does that all day, Dan. Well, he was, he was quite a, he was a boy when he discovered it. No, that, it's not as bad as it sounds. They have these two images, and they have what they call a blink comparator, which sort of shows you the two images alternately. Uh -huh. So you see, you just look at one thing, but if you see a star flicker, it's because it's jumped from one plate to the other. So it's not as bad as it sounds. Gee, it sounds, it sounds awful to have to do that. Uh, I, another tiresome subject, of course, is life on other planets. But I was going to ask you once, uh, you once made a statement about that, that you thought it was possible. Why do we always assume that if there is life on another planet, that it's superior life? That, it, that We always assume that they're ahead of us, don't we, in most it's science fiction? It's hard to imagine the reverse. Hard to imagine anyone dumber than we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. But um, actually, there is a logical reason. I mean, we are a very new species, yeah. depending on what you call Homo sapiens, we've been around at most 100,000 years in a recognizably human form. And that's a mere moment, that's just the last you know, few seconds in the history of the universe. So if life got started almost anywhere on any other planet, it might have, it would, one would expect by the sheer laws of probability, be hundreds of thousands, of millions of years ahead of us now. And, and, and no one ever assumes that it would be behind us, because if they were able to contact us, then well, presumably they're more advanced be, uh, than we are. Unless, we, of course, we discovered them somehow. This may happen as well, of course. Mm -hmm. they're prob I'd say there's a good probability there's some form of life in the solar system, uh, either on Mars or possibly in the clouds of Jupiter. But that will almost certainly be much more primitive. 
This would really upset religion, wouldn't it, in the fundamentalist sense, because then it would have to be, and God created the earth and several other places, or, I mean, the idea would have to be revised. In the... mm, not necessarily. There was a certain amount of uh, disturbance about this, but most uh, religious people uh, now quite accept this. In fact, the Pope received the astronaut some years ago and you know, said this is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that only a few extreme fundamentalists will be really upset, even by intelligent life elsewhere. Mm -hmm. There are still those flat earthers in England, I believe, a few uh, left. There was one, but I think he's died recently, probably of a broken heart. Oh. <laughs> Asked to be pushed off the edge at the end or something. That's terrible taste to make a joke about a man's death. Um, well, you once wrote a piece, and I'm trying to remember what it was in. Gee, I hope it was you. It was about... It's good, it's <laughs> you know, good I'll claim it. The interviewer's nightmare. Um, about impossibilities, things that can never take yeah. place. Uh, Certain myths like uh, perpetual motion machine, I think, was in it. And squaring the circle. Squaring and, the circle, yeah. um, traveling through time. Some of them are favorites of science fiction writers. Um, what, what, what's the thing about the perpetual motion machine, other than the fact that any machine would wear out after a time? Well, it depends, again, on definitions. In the, the solar system of planets moving around the sun is, in a way, a perpetual motion machine. It'll go on for it, essentially forever. But the classic idea of a perpetual motion machine, which people have tried to make, is a machine which will keep producing power. You can always draw energy out of it. It'll drive, a, say, a, an automobile forever. Well, this is as, nonsense, as ridiculous as, a, uh, say, a jug from which you can pour beer on liquid indefinitely. Obviously, when you put it in that form, that's, that is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Magic. Uh, but people don't realize that energy is as concrete you know, as, as, a, as a substance. So you couldn't have anything to produce energy indefinitely. Energy gets used up. It, it's got to come from somewhere. Maybe there are, and there, there's no objection to tapping unknown energy sources, perhaps mm -hmm. from some black box which might tap cosmic forces or electricity from the air or whatever. Yeah, why couldn't it take enough energy from the sun each ah, day yes, to store itself through the night and then regenerate? That's a different it. thing, you see. That's just tapping power. It's not a perpetual motion machine which would, could be sealed up and still produce energy indefinitely. Have, have Through history, have they sat around and tinkered with a machine that would run itself by weights oh, and yes, things? And yes, yes. Uh, this is a, People have been doing this for hundreds of years and they're still doing it. And um, my college professor once gave us a lecture in which he described these various perpetual motion machines Many of them do depend on weights, which go round and overbalance. Mm -hmm. And um, he defied us to explain why they were f phony. You know, it's, it can be quite complicated, very hard to explain why they won't work. Yeah. 